Sushruta for Neat is now available on the Google Play Store. Try it out for free. Hi, good evening, everybody. I am Professor J.K. Bert. Hearty welcome to Biology Classes of Janamarga.in. My dear students, in today's class, we shall start new chapter of the 11th standard, last chapter of the 11th standard, that is chemical coordination and integration. In the last chapter, we have seen how this nervous system is concerned with uh, regulating all our uh, body activities. As you have been told, nervous system alone cannot do all these functions, cannot control all the activities of the body. It requires the involvement of the endocrine system. And this we are going to study in today's class, chemical coordination and integration. We have already learned that the nervous system, also known as neural system, provides a point-to-point -point rapid coordination among organs. Central nervous system through peripheral nervous system is connected with each and every tissues in our body. This is what we say point-to-point -point connection. And which brings about a rapid coordination in the function of all different organs of the body. But the neural coordination, even though it is a fast, it is a short-lived. As the nerve fibers do not innervate all cells of the body, and the cellular functions need to be continuously regulated, a special kind of coordination and regulation has to be provided. Nerve fibers do not innervate all cells of the body. That is one important point. Each and every cell is not uh, supplied with uh, the nerve fibers or not connected with the efferent or efferent nerve fibers. But the cellular function has to be continuously regulated, monitored. But each and every cell is not uh, innervated by the nerves. Innervate here means getting connected with the nervous system. A special kind of coordination regression has to be provided and this function is carried out by hormones. That means the nervous system and the endocrine system jointly work together. They jointly coordinate nervous system and endocrine system work together. They jointly coordinate and regulate the physiological functions in the body. We shall see how this uh, nervous system and this uh, endocrine system work together, where they are interconnected, how they jointly monitor the functioning of the body, that we shall study in today's class. Endocrine glands are the glands without duct. They are also called ductless glands. In contrast to exocrine glands, which are the glands with the ducts. Your digestive glands are all examples for exocrine glands. You have oil glands, sweat glands, these are the examples, also the examples for the glands with the duct. In contrast to these glands with the duct, what you call exocrine glands, we have ductless glands called endocrine glands. 
and these endocrine glands secrete hormones. What is a hormone? The classical definition for hormone is hormone is a chemical produced by endocrine glands released into the blood and transported to a distinctly located target organ. You must know that the organ on which these hormones act upon, they are generally found away from the gland which produces this hormone. So, target organs are generally distantly located, not very nearly located. So, this is what the definition of the regulatory hormone, but more scientific definition of the hormone, more scientific definition is as follows. Hormones are non-nutrient chemicals. They are not the one which gives you the energy. They are not the nutrient like uh, chemicals. They are the non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messenger sending the message between the cells. Hormones act as intercellular messengers and are produced in a trace amount. They are produced in very, very, very less amount. In micrograms, milligrams, nanograms. The new definition covers a number of new molecules in addition to the hormones secreted by the organized endocrine glands. We say that hormones are non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messenger. That means uh, taking the message between the cells and are produced always in uh, milligrams in trace amounts. And there are different types of hormones produced by different glands also other than the organized endocrine glands. Which are these endo organized endocrine glands? Let us see. Invertebrates possess very simple endocrine system with the few hormones, whereas a large number of chemicals act as hormones and provide coordination invertebrates. If you look into the invertebrates, it is amongst the arthropods that to amongst the insects you do come across well organized endocrine system. What it is simple endocrine system. The very simple endocrine system is noticed for the first time amongst the arthropods, amongst the invertebrates. On the other hand, when you compare this uh, with the vertebrates, vertebrates always uh, possess little bit of complex endocrine system. Now, we are going to study here the human endocrine system. This is just to show you the invertebrate endocrine system. I have just mentioned you that invertebrate endocrine system is best developed in case of the arthropods in general, insects in particular. Look here. You can make out here the brain of the invertebrate like arthropod and associated with this brain, you come across the two of the glands, corpus cardiacum and corpus elatum, or which is otherwise known as corpora cardiaca and corpora elata, plural. You must know, this is an important uh, concept, even though it is not mentioned in the NCERT book, you are supposed to know. We come across here, neurosecretary cells in the brain produce brain hormone, which is called BH, neurosecretary cells, you can see a neurosecretary cells in the brain, they produce brain hormone, which is abbreviated as BH, which is stored in the corpora cardiaca. This is corpus cardiacum, which is stored in the corpora cardiaca until they are released. Now, what happens here? The brain hormone, which is stored in the corpus cardiacum, it comes here 
Brain hormone signals its main target organ, prothoracic gland. This is what the gland that you come across in the prothoracic segment. Prothoracic segment is the first segment in the insects in the thoracic region. So, brain hormone signals its main target organ, the prothoracic gland, to produce the hormone ecdysone. To produce the hormone ecdysone. You must know the prothoracic gland produces ecdysone. Right? For the prothoracic gland to produce ecdysone, the brain hormone should be released from the corpus cardiacal. Then, ecdysone secretion from the prothoracic gland is episodic with each release stimulating mode. So, ecdysone is the hormone which stimulates the molting. Ecdysone, which brings about ecdysis. Ecdysis means molting. So, as long as this uh, brain hormone is produced, as long as this uh, prothoracic gland is stimulated to produce ecdysone, as long as this ecdysone is produced, the, the larva shows uh, molting, one after another. Now, you have another hormone called juvenile hormone, JH. Juvenile hormone is uh, secreted by the corpora alata. Corpus alata means a singular, corpora alata pleura. And this determines the result of the mold. At uh, relatively high concentration of juvenile hormone, ecdysone stimulating molting produce another larva stage. Juvenile hormone suppresses the metamorphosis. But when the levels of juvenile hormone fall below a certain concentration, a pupa forms. At the next ecdysone induced mold, the adult insect emerges from the pupa. So, juvenile hormone, as long as the juvenile hormone is secreted, the larva remains a larval condition only. What is most important is that the juvenile hormone, always juvenile hormone suppresses metamorphosis. So even though the ecdysone continues with the ecdysone, that with the ecdysone, the ecdysis continues, this results in uh, molting after molting. As soon as the juvenile hormone is there, the larva remains in the larval condition only. When the juvenile hormone level falls down in its concentration, the molting results in the next stage, that is the pupa. So what you have to remember, corpus allotum produces a juvenile hormone. Corpora alata produces a, that it stores the this brain hormone, it goes to prothoracic gland and makes the prothoracic gland to produce that of the ecclesome. This is what you have to know at least. Now let us look into human endocrine system. The endocrine glands and hormone producing, diffu hormone producing diffused tissue cells located in different parts of our body constitute the endocrine system. So, our endocrine system does not include only the endocrine glands present in our body main endocrine glands. We do have many diffused uh, tissues or cells also here and there in the body which also produce this uh, hormone and all these uh, together constitute endocrine system. Pituitary, pineal, thyroid, adrenal, pancreas, parathyroid, thymus, Gonads, that is the testes in males and ovaries in female, all these are organized endocrine bodies in our body. These are very systematically placed endocrine glands in our body. So whenever we say organized endocrine glands, it refers to it refers to pituitary, pineal gland, thyroid gland, adrenal, pancreas, parathyroid, thymus, and gonads. Testes and ovary. Look at this diagram. You can see very clearly these different uh, endocrine glands. You have the pineal, you have the hypothalamus, pituitary down below, of course, here, and then thyroid with parathyroid, thymus, pancreas, adrenal, testis in case of male, and ovary in case of female. The same glands are shown in another diagram. You can see the different endocrine glands, organized endocrine glands in a male and female, right? In addition to these organized endocrine glands, 
some other organs for example gastrointestinal tract liver kidney heart also produce hormones let us say what all hormones are produced by these uh, organs later now let us study the structure and functions of all major endocrine glands and the hypothalamus of the human body the hypothalamus hypothalamus as the name itself indicates it is situated below the thalamus hypothalamus hypothalamus is the part basal part of diencephalon of the forebrain and it regulates a wide spectrum of body function we generally think that the, or say that the pituitary gland is a master gland no doubt but this master gland is controlled by its mistress that is hypothalamus hypothalamus contains several groups of neurosecretions also called nuclei which produce hormones you have the hypothalamus to possess groups of several groups of neurosecretions and these groups of neurosecretions are called nuclei and these nuclei are known to produce hormones let us see what all nuclei are there and what they produce these hormones hypothalamus hormones hypothalamic hormones regulate the synthesis and the secretion of a pituitary hormone so the synthesis and the secretion of a pituitary hormone is directly under the control of hypothalamus however the hormones produced by hypothalamus are of two types one is release hormone or releasing hormone which stimulates the secretion of pituitary hormone and another one is release inhibiting hormone or inhibiting hormone which inhibit secretion of pituitary hormone hypothalamus produces two types of hormones one hormone it stimulates secretion of pituitary hormones or which stimulates secretion of hormones from the pituitary or by the pituitary and another one it stops the secretion of hormones by the pituitary so there are two hormones release hormone and release inhibiting hormone or inhibiting hormone look here this is the diagram of pituitary this is the diagram of hypothalamus to where the pituitary is attached if you look into this hypothalamus there are many neurosecretices and these neurosecretices are concerned with the secretion of some hormones basically it is of two types releasing hormone and release inhibiting hormone in this diagram we can see here is one nucleus and this nucleus is called paraventricular nucleus and another nucleus supra optic nucleus even though it is not mentioned in ncert book it is always better to know these are two types of nuclei paraventricular nucleus concerned with the secretion of oxytocin and supra optic nucleus concerned with the production of vasopressin paraventricular nucleus is concerned with the production of oxytocin supra optic nucleus is concerned with the production of vasopressin how to remember po post office m n o p o and p are very very nearer alphabets PO, paraventricular oxytocin. Supra, yes, V, they are nearer. Yes, supra optic nucleus and V, vasopressin. And these are the different uh, neurosecretaries in the hypothalamus. And these neurosecretaries, by producing either release hormone or release in it, in hormone, they control the production of the hormones by this uh, anterior pituitary. Look into this diagram. This is hypothalamus. As mentioned, hypothalamus is with the neurosecretory cells. Neurosecretory cells produce releasing and release inhibiting hormones, 
releasing and a release inhibiting hormone. These hormones are secreted into a portal system. You can see here, this is the portal system here. Hypothalamic, hypopaisal portal system, or simply pituitary portal system, or hypopaisal portal system. You know, a portal system starts with the capillary and ends in capillary. Each type of hypothalamic uh, hormone either stimulates or inhibits the production or secretion of another pituitary hormone. So there is one hormone in the hypothalamus, and this hormone, whenever it is uh, secreted, if at all it is a releasing hormone, it stimulates the release of production, synthesis of another hormone by the pituitary. Or if at all it is an inhibiting hormone, it stops the synthesis of that particular hormone. The anterior pituitary secretes its hormone into a bloodstream. You can see here, this is what you have in anterior pituitary, this is the posterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary mainly produces following hormones, gonadotropin, Gonadotropin, which includes FSH and LH. Then you have growth hormone, GH, prolactin, PRL, also known as a luteotropic hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone on ACTH, and a thyroid stimulating hormone on TSH. And posterior pituitary, it produces two hormones. One is <coughs> ADH, antidiuretic hormone, <coughs> or also known as vasopressin. And another is the oxytocin. So the neurocytotic cells produce ADH and oxytocin, whatever that you have here. You have already seen oxytocin is produced by paraventricular nucleus, and the vasopressin is produced by supraoptic nucleus. So neurocytotic cells produce ADH and oxytocin. These hormones move down axons, move down the axons. So axon endings ends, and here they get to store in a postipitate. When appropriate, ADH and oxytocin are secreted from the axon and end, 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 ends, ends into the blood stream. Right? Now let us look at Now again, hypothalamic hormone. Hypothalamic hormone called gonadotropin, releasing hormone, GnRH, stimulates the pituitary synthesis and the release of gonadotropins. Hypothalamic hormone called gonadotropin, releasing hormone, stimulates pituitary synthesis and the release of gonadotropins. Gonadotropins. On the other hand, somatostatin from the hypothalamus inhibits the release of growth hormone from the pituitary. So, as I told you, as I told you, you have two types of hormones produced by the hypothalamus. One is releasing hormone and another one is release inhibiting hormone. So somatostatin is a release inhibiting hormone. And gonadotropin is a releasing hormone. When gonadotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone is producer, is producer. It makes the anterior pituitary to produce the gonadotropins like LH and the FSH. Only then somatostatin from the hypothalamus inhibits the release of growth hormone from the pituitary. We shall study which are all releasing hormones and we shall also study which are all the inhibiting hormones. So both the releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones are produced by the hypothalamus. Let us look into that. These hormones originating in the hypothalamic neurons pass through axons and are released from their nerve endings. Look here. This is the hypothalamic region with the neurosecretory cells. So when CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, this is called CRH is corticotropin releasing hormone. When this hormone is produced, corticotropin releasing hormone is produced. It comes down to the anterior pituitary and makes the anterior pituitary to produce adenocorticotropic hormone. For the adenocorticotropic hormone to be secreted by the anterior pituitary, corticotropin releasing hormone should be secreted by the hypothalamus. If the hypothalamus produces a CRH, then only pituitary produces ACTH. This ACTH, adenocorticotropic hormone, 
once it gets released into blood, it comes to the adrenal cortex and makes the adrenal cortex to produce its hormone that is the corticosteroids. In the same way, if the anterior pituitary to produce the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, from the hypothalamus, TRH should be produced. TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. When the thyrotropin releasing hormone is um, produced in the hypothalamus, it comes down to the anterior pituitary, makes the anterior pituitary to produce the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and this the thyroid stimulating hormone through the blood goes to the thyroid gland, makes the thyroid gland to produce a thyroid hormones. Similarly, as mentioned earlier, gonadotropin releasing hormones, once they are produced inside the hypothalamus, they get released, they get released into the antipetotry to the portal system. So this, it uh, makes this uh, antipetotry to produce lutein hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. Both these LH and FSH, they go to the gonadal region and makes the testes to produce male hormone, testosterone, and the ovary to produce the female hormones, estrogen and the progesterone. In the same way, when the neuroendocrine cells are in the hypothalamus, when you come across in the, the hypothalamus, prolactin releasing hormone is produced. It makes the antiepitator to produce the prolactin, and this prolactin makes the mammary glands to produce this uh, milk. In the same way, when the somatokinin is produced by the hypothalamus, it stimulates the antiepitator to produce a growth hormone. And this growth hormone results in the growth of the bones or brings about the oral growth of the body. The moment the somatostatin, it is inhibiting hormone, is produced by the hypothalamus, it stops the production of growth hormone by the pituitary. So in this way, for each and every hormone to be produced by the anterior pituitary, there should be the releasing hormone produced by the hypothalamus. If the hormone production has to be stopped, hypothalamus has to produce inhibiting hormone or release inhibiting hormone. It is another diagram showing the same thing. These hormones reach the pituitary gland, that is, whatever the hormones that are produced by this uh, hypothalamus, these hormones reach the pituitary gland through a portal circuitry system and regulate the functions of the anterior pituitary. You have already heard about the portal system in human body or in general, in animals, you come across the three types of portal system. Hepatic portal system, renal portal system, and finally, that the pituitary portal system. You know, hepatic portal system involves hepatic vein, hepatic portal vein, and renal portal system involves renal portal vein, and pituitary portal system here, you will come across the blood vessels to start with the start at the hypothalamus and end in the blood capillaries. And this is a connection between the pituitary and the hypothalamus. The posterior pituitary is under direct neural regulation. There is no portal system in the posterior pituitary, concerned with posterior pituitary. So the portal system is found only related to the or in between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. In between the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary, there is no portal system and directly secretion of this uh, hypothalamus. Directly it is brought to, through the axonal ends to the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is under the direct neuronal neural regulation of the hypothalamus. Look here. This is the diagram that you have in your NCT book. This is hypothalamus showing you the neurons ending in the portal secretion and this portal secretion, pituitary portal system, bringing that uh, hormones to the anterior pituitary. But with regard to the posterior pituitary, there is no portal secretion directly the axonal end which starts uh, in the hypothalamic region. It releases to the pituitary, posterior pituitary. So, now let us look into the details of this uh, pituitary. 
the pituitary gland is located in a bony cavity called cella tercica. This is what you have a, bo a bony cavity. This bony cavity is called cella tercica. And you must know where this uh, bony cavity, cella tercica situated. Cella tercica bony cavity is uh, present in the sphenoid bone. This bone is a sphenoid bone. It is present in the sphenoid bone. To remember it, cella tercica, sphenoid bone. Yes, yes, sphenoid bone. The pituitary gland is located in a bony cavity called cella tercica and is attached to hypothalamus by a stalk. This is uh, the hypothalamus region and this is the stalk. You can see the pituitary here. Right? The pituitary is divided anatomically into two parts. One is anterior pituitary, also called adenohypophysis, and another one, posterior pituitary, also called neurohypophysis. Pituitary is reducible into anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary is also called adenohypophysis, posterior pituitary is also called neurohypophysis. Hello? Yeah, please call after one hour, okay? The adeno hypophysis consists of two portions, pars distalis and pars intermedia. So, pituitary is divisible into two parts, anterior and posterior. Anterior pituitary is also called adeno hypophysis, posterior pituitary is called neurohypophysis. Adeno hypophysis consists of two portions, pars distalis and pars intermedia. This is pars intermedia. Or it is called intermediate to low, parts intermedia. The parts distalis, this is parts distalis, the, this part. The parts distalis produces six hormones. The parts distalis region pituitary, commonly called anterior pituitary, produces growth hormone, abbreviated as GH, prolactin, PRL, also known as luteotropic hormone, LTH, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. These are the six hormones produced by pars distalis. Growth hormone, PRL, or prolactin, thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone. Right? Pars intermedia, this is what you have pars intermedia. Secrets only one hormone called melanocyte stimulating hormone abbreviated as MSH. However, in humans, pars intermedia, pars intermedia is almost merged with the pars distalis. Pars intermedia is merged with the pars distalis. Therefore, we say anterior pituitary or adenohypophysis produces seven hormones. If you don't ask it, how many hormones are produced by pars distalis? Answer is a six. How many hormones are produced by adenohypophysis? In general, it is a seven. Because it includes this MSH also, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Now, let us look into the neurohypophysis. Neurohypophysis, also known as pars nervosa, otherwise known as posterior pituitary. It stores and releases the hormones. We have to remember, neurohypophysis or posterior pituitary never produces any hormone. It only stores the hormone produced by the hypothalamus. Neurohypophysis also known as posterior pituitary, pituitary, posterior pituitary parts nervosa, stores and releases the two hormones called oxytocin and vasopressin. You know, vasopressin is also called ADH, antidiuretic hormone which are actually synthesized by the hypothalamus. Oxytocin and vasopressin, these are actually produced by the hypothalamus. They are released through the axonal ends and they come to the posterior pituitary and they get stored here. So posterior pituitary or neurohypophysis or pars nervosa stores and later releases the hormones produced by that of the hypothalamus and are transported axonally to the neurohypophysis. Now let us see what will happen if the, these hormones, anterior pituitary hormone, if they are produced more or less. Whenever the production is more, 
we say that it is hypersecretion. Whenever the production is less, we say it is a hyposecretion. Over secretion growth hormone stimulates abnormal growth of the body leading to gigantism. And low secretion growth hormone results in stunted growth resulting in pituitary dwarfism. So one results in overgrowth, another one results in stunted growth. So overgrowth, abnormal growth of the body leading to gigantism. And low secretion of growth hormone, that is a hyposecretion growth hormone, results in stunted growth, resulting in pituitary dwarfism. Now let us see pituitary gigants and pituitary dwarfs. This is not a pituitary dwarfism we have. <laughs> this is not a doll. This is not a doll. This is uh, actually the baby of two years. Exactly, it looks like a doll. This is an example for pituitary dwarfism, where you come across the growth hormone is produced very less. Same thing, pituitary dwarfism, both of these are of a 14 year old. Look here, this 14 year old boy, it is pituitary dwarfism. All these are examples for pituitary dwarfs. This is the example for pituitary gigantism. Tall individuals, extremely tall. This is the tallest individual on record, in Guinness record. Sultan Qasim is a Turkish man who is the current record holder of the tallest living man in the world, as noted in the Guinness World Book. 8 feet, 1.2 inches tall. You have here, this is what I have, Sultan Qasim. 8 inch, uh, 9 feet, sorry, 8 feet, uh, 9 inch it is said. And this is the shortest. Chanda Bahadur Dangi, 21 and a half inch. Tallest person, shortest person on record in the world. Now, if the pituitary, if this growth hormone is produced less, what will happen? This when it's a loss of secondary sexual characteristics and absence of pubic hair, it is due to hypopituitarism, low secretion of the growth hormone after attaining adulthood. It is known as Simon's disease. Hyposecretion of the growth hormone in adult results in Simon's disease or after puberty, after attaining puberty, results in Simon's disease. And Higher secretion of the growth hormone results in what is called the acromegaly. Hyper secretion results in acromegaly. And most important is that you can see that uh, spade shaped hand and feet. These are the very important physical uh, symptoms. Along with that, you have to come across the large nose and jaws, teeth separated or lacking. Prognathous condition. This is acromegaly showing you that is uh, acromegaly is due to overproduction or higher production, hypersecretion of the growth hormone after puberty. Look into the fingers and the toes here, hands, feet in the toes, spread like. Prolactin or luteotropic hormone regulates the growth of the mammary glands and formation of milk in them. You must know that it is. Uh, the formation of the milk, not the secretion of the milk. Secretion of the milk is the function of the oxytocin. TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone, stimulates the synthesis and the secretion of thyroid hormones from the thyroid gland. Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. ACTH stimulates the synthesis and secretion of steroid hormones called glucocorticoids from the adrenal cortex. LH and FSH stimulate gonadal activity and hence are called gonadotropins. So we do come across. Now, these are called gonadotropins. What is a tropic hormone? A tropic hormone is one. Once it is produced, after reaching the target uh, gland, it makes the target gland to produce its own hormone. For example, 
FSH, LH, these are considered as a tropic hormones. These gonadotropins, tropic hormones. FSH and LH, once they are produced by the anterior pituitary, they get a release into the blood, they come to the testes and make the testes to produce its own hormone, testosterone. And uh, makes the ovary to produce its own hormone, estrogen and progesterone. Those hormones which make the target against to produce their own hormone, they are known as tropic hormones. So these are gonadotropins, LH and FSH, these are examples for such tropic hormones. In males, luteinizing hormone stimulates the synthesis and secretion of hormones called androgen from testes. The LH hormone, which is produced by the anterior pituitary, comes to the blood to the testes and makes the testes to produce the androgen hormone. In males, FSH and androgen regulate spermatogenesis. Both are required to regulate these spermatogenesis. In females, luteinizing hormone induces ovulation of a fully mature pollicles, graphene pollicle, and maintains the corpus luteum, formed from the remnants of the graphene pollicle after ovulation. So, therefore, we know that uh, LH hormone is also known as ovulating hormone. It results in ovulation. In females, LH induces ovulation by the fully mature pollicles, and LH is also concerned in the maintenance of corpus luteum, and corpus luteum is formed by the remnants of graphene pollicle after ovulation which we are going to study in detail in the 12th standard portion. The FSH stimulates growth and the development of the ovarian follicles in female. The FSH stimulates growth and development of the ovarian follicles in the female, that is in the ovary. The MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, acts on the melanocyte and regulates the pigmentation of the skin. Melanocyte hormone is concerned with the pigmentation of the skin. Oxytocin acts on the smooth muscles of our body and stimulates their concentration. Oxytocin in females, it stimulates vigorous contraction of uterus at the time of childbirth and milk ejection from the mammary gland. So childbirth and milk ejection from the mammary gland is mainly concerned with oxytocin. Vasopressin acts mainly at the kidney and stimulates the resorption of water and electrolytes by the distal tubules and thereby reduces the loss of water through urine, diuresis. Vasopressin is also known as antidiuretic hormone. And this antidiuretic hormone, it stimulates reabsorption of water and electrolytes by the distal tubules and thereby reduces loss of water to the urine. It prevents uh, the water diuresis. Now, let us look into the pineal gland. The pineal gland is located on the dorsal side of the brain. This is where you have the pineal gland or pineal gland. The pineal, secre pineal secretes a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin plays a very important role in the regulation of 24 hour rhythm of our body, diurnal rhythm. So, melatonin is concerned with the biological clock, diurnal rhythm. For example, it helps in maintaining the normal rhythms of sleep, sleep wake cycle and body temperature. Mel melatonin. He is concerned with sleep wake cycle. It is also concerned with maintenance of body temperature. We already studied that maintenance of body temperature is the function of the hypothalamus. Yes, it is a function of the hypothalamus. At the same time, it is also the function of the function of the pineal gland. In addition, melatonin also influences metabolism, pigmentation, menstrual cycle, as well as our defense capability. So all these metabolism pigmentation, menstrual cycle. It is very important that you generally you think that menstrual cycle is uh, regulated by only two hormones, that is estrogen and that of the progesterone. So here you must know the pineal gland is also concerned with menstrual cycle. As well as the mel melatonin is concerned over defense capability. Now, let us take up the next gland, that is the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is composed of two lobes. You have two lobes here, which are located on either side of the trachea. This is the trachea, on either side of the trachea. Both lobes are interconnected with a thin flap of connective tissue called isthmus. This is the isthmus, which connects these two lobes together. Isthmus. This is what the NCRT book diagram. Thyroid gland, isthmus, and this is what you have 
the ventral side showing the presence of parathyroid glands. Thyroid gland is composed of follicles and stomal tissue. Look here, these are the follicles. And what you have in between, these are the stomal tissues. Stomal tissues. Each thyroid follicle is composed of follicular cells. These are the follicular cells enclosing a cavity. One point that you have to remember is that thyroid gland is different from all other endocrine glands in that the hormone produced by the thyroid gland before getting released to the blood is stored inside the gland itself for some time. The thyroid hormone produced by the thyroid gland is not immediately released into the blood. Before getting released into the blood, it gets accumulated in the cavity present inside the follicular cells. Each thyroid follicle is composed of follicular cells enclosing a cavity. And in this cavity, the thyroid hormone that is produced is stored for some time before getting released to the blood. These follicular cells synthesize two hormones, tetraiodothyronine or thyroxine T4 and triiodothyronine T3. So tetraiodothyronine or thyroxine and triiodothyronine T3, these are the two types of hormones produced by the follicular cells. So thyroxine, thyroxine we say. So generally we refer to thyroxine, it is a T4 and triiodothyronine is a T3. Iodine is essential for the normal rate of hormone synthesis in thyroid. So for the thyroid gland to produce a thyroid hormone, iodine is a very essential. You know, nowadays we are using whatever salt we are using, they are all iodized salt. In earlier days, it was not like that. When this uh, thyroid problem is a uh, thyroid problem started to get in into the life of each and every person. Now the government has forced to go for the salt always iodized. So iodine is essential for the normal rate of hormone synthesis in the thyroid. Look here, deficiency of iodine in our diet results in what is known as hypothyroidism. Deficiency of iodine in our diet results in hypothyroidism and enlargement of the thyroid gland. Whenever there is a hypothyroidism, less secretion of the hypothyroid hormone, the gland itself it starts to produce more of the hormone. So enlargement of thyroid gland is commonly called goiter. You can see that this particular lady is suffering from goiter. Enlargement of the thyroid gland and this is due to hypothyroidism. This is what is called multinodular goiter. Look here. All these uh, are the multinodular goiter. Again, it is due to hypothyroidism. And this is also umbilical hernia is also due to hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism during pregnancy causes the defective development and maturation of the growing baby, mature, uh, uh, causes defective development and maturation of the growing baby, leading to stunted growth. Stunted growth in babies referred to as a cretinism. And these babies suffer from mental retardation, low intelligent quotient, abnormal skin, depth mutism, etc. All these are due to hypothyroidism during pregnancy, resulting in such a babies with all abnormalities. In adult women, hypothyroidism may cause menstrual cycle to become irregular. So again, one more hormone is added to the menstrual cycle. So menstrual cycle is not due to that uh, all that uh, the four hormones which you know, which you are going to study later, and this hormone is also concerned with the regulator of a menstrual cycle. This is uh, the baby suffering from cretinism. Cretinism is a form of hypothyroidism found in infants. Cretinism is a condition of severely stunted physical and mental growth due to untreated congenital deficiency of thyroid hormone. The symptoms which appear during early infancy are the gradual development of characteristic scores, dry skin, a slightly swollen face and a tongue. Due to cancer of the thyroid gland or due to development of nodules of the thyroid gland, the rate of synthesis and secretion thyroid hormones is increased to abnormally high level, leading to condition called hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism refers to secretion of high level of thyroid hormone. This also adversely affects the body physiology. Thyroids, uh, thyroid hormones play an important role in the regulation of basal metabolic rate. What is this basal metabolic rate? 
thyroid hormone is very much concerned with the regulation of BMR. Basal metabolic rate is the amount of energy expressed in calories that a person needs to keep the body functioning at rest. So BMR refers to how much energy is required by a person during rest. If at all we think that, if at all we think that uh, more of this, uh, we don't uh, require more more energy during this, during this, uh, if you think that we require more, more energy during the daytime, it is wrong. We require more energy during nighttime than during daytime. Basal metabolic rate is the amount of energy expressed in calories that a person needs to, to keep the body functioning at rest. Some of those uh, processes are breathing, blood circulation, controlling body temperature, cell growth, brain and nerve function, contraction functions. None of the functions stop when we are taking rest. All the body functions go on as usual. So how much energy is required during the rest of the body? That is known as a base cell metabolic rate. Base cell metabolic rate accounts for about 60 to 70 percent of the daily calorie expenditure by individual. It is influenced by several factors. These hormones also support the process of red blood cell formation. That is the thyroid hormones also support the process of red blood cell formation. Thyroid hormones control metabolism, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. All basic metabolism of uh, carbohydrate, protein, fats are also controlled by thyroid hormones. Maintenance of water and electrolyte balance is also influenced by thyroid hormone. Thyroid gland also secretes the protein hormone called thyrocalcitonin, TCTA, which regulates the blood calcium level. So this is another important function of the thyroid gland. Then is the hormone that is called as a TCT, simply called calcitonin. Thyrocalcitonin or calcitonin, it is concerned with the regulation of blood calcium level. Let us see how. Look here. This is what uh, normal calcium level in blood. Always calcium level in the blood should be maintained at a particular rate. Suppose the calcium level in the blood is too high. If calcium level is too high, at that time, the thyroid gland produces a calcitonin, thyrocalcitonin. What this does? Thyrocalcitonin, it makes the bone to absorb the calcium. So increase calcium deposition in the bone. When there is a high level of calcium in the blood, thyrocalcitonin is produced. This thyrocalcitonin makes the bone to get the calcium deposited in it. So calcium gets the deposit in it. And at the same time, the thyrocalcitonin also decreases calcium uptake in intestine and also decreases calcium reabsorption from the urine. So because whatever excess calcium is there, it is already got deposited in the bone and no more uh, that absorption of the calcium in the intestine or from the urine. So calcium level falls down and comes to normal. If calcium level is too low at that time, if the calcium level in the blood is too low, Parathyroid releases a parathyroid hormone. When the parathyroid hormone is produced, it increases calcium release from the bone. So from the bone, calcium gets released. So from the bone, the calcium comes to the blood and also increases calcium absorption in the intestine, increases calcium reabsorption from the urine. So calcium level raises up. So in this way, this uh, calcitonin and the parathyroid hormone, they play more important role in maintaining homeostasis in the blood, right? So in this context, you must also know what is the Graves' disease. Sometimes you'll be asked, what is the Graves' disease? Graves' disease is a common cause of hyperthyroidism, more secretion of the thyroid hormone and overproduction of thyroid hormone, which causes enlargement of the thyroid and other symptoms such as exothymous condition, heat intolerance, and anxiety. So with this, we have completed today's lecture and we are going to take up the continuation of this in next lecture.